I, I can't say otherwise. I, I usually try to be kind, but this was an absolute idiot because he told us, if you want to do new things, discover new things, physics is not for you because we know it all by now. Uh, I, I think there have been one or two big discoveries since then. Anyway, the fortunate effect of that was that I started studying biology. And after doing my bachelor's, um, I encountered Hans von der Beelen. And um, I guess that in the US you would call this a lab rotation. Um, it was one year where I worked in the lab on a big experiment. And this resulted in my first publication that came out in 19, what was it, 1979, 78. Um, what we had done was we had treated mice uh, with zinc sulfate. Body, um, but I don't really need my body. This is about Trump's body. I think this whole thing's been blown way out of proportion, you know? Like, you know? Like, um, yeah. Who's talking? <laughs> but it's because... Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so, so what we had done is we um, rendered mice a nosmake. Uh, by flushing their nose with zinc sulfate. It's not an easy procedure, but we got it going. And um, we did a strain comparison of the effects of anosmia on exploratory behavior in an open field. An open field will come back. Um, we used two strains, the C57 Black 6 strain that always has a reliably very high score of rearing. Rearing is when the animals sit on their hind legs so that they can look around. Uh, the forepaws are free. Uh, if they are near the wall, doing it near the wall and the forepaws are against the wall, we call them leaning. And that is a quite different behavior, even though it looks the same. Um, black sixes reliably have much higher scores of rearing in an open field than uh, DBA2s. So these were the saline controls. Now, if you treated them with zinc sulfate and rendered them anosmic, what you saw was a huge decrease in the black six, whereas the DBA2 was not significant, but the DBA2 actually increased. And here the strain difference in the saline group was significant with black six significantly higher than DBA2. It was significant again in the zinc sulfate group, but now in the opposite direction. Now the blacks were lower than the DBA2s. So it was quite an interesting phenomenon that we saw there. Um, I, I'm, I'm saying that I was doing behavior genetics. Um, it, it, it's sometimes a little bit weird to see in, in like say science that somebody makes a remark since the 1990s, we can do behavior genetics uh, because behavior genetics is a pretty old field actually already. It, 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 uh, dates back to even before the uh, Mendel's laws were rediscovered. And as soon as Mendel's laws were rediscovered, uh, one of the first genes uh, studied was a, a gene in Drosophila influencing the behavior of these fruit flies. Um, of course, the techniques that we had at the time were very different from what we have now. Um, the things that we would do was look at spontaneous mutations sometimes induced by mutagens, but that was actually in mice rare. In, in Drosophila, that was much more common. Um, selective breeding was very important. Um, it, it, it's a very laborious thing, of course, because over generation after generation after generation, you select animals for a high or a low expression of a certain behavior. Um, but the, the importance of it was that it convincingly showed that behavior actually could be inherited. And while that may seem trivial to us nowadays, uh, don't forget that these, these were the days, the 60s and the 70s of behaviorism, uh, where psychologists would claim that everything was determined by, um, by the environment and not by uh, that the genes didn't have any big effect. Uh, selective breeding did a lot in convincing people that this was too too easy and that genes actually did play a role. 
Inbred strength comparisons, uh, it's, it's simple. You take strains and you look at differences, but uh, people like Hans van Abelen used it, these strain comparisons to figure out things about how behavior was being regulated. Um, a very important part of behavior genetics at the time was also crossbreeding studies, um, especially the classical Mendelian cross where you have two strains in F1, F2 and back crosses and the dialogue cross. I'll come back to that in a second. The, uh, the species that we would use uh, were a lot of mouse work, of course, but there was also a lot of work being done with rats. Several of the selected breeding uh, lines that I mentioned before were rat lines, the, the Maudsley uh, high and low emotionality rats and the Roman high and low avoidance rats. And fruit fly, of course, was a very important organism. Uh, of now, there's the fact that it was not that much neuroscience. It, it, it was genes and behavior, like there was nothing in between. There were only a few people like Hans van Bellen, as I just mentioned, uh, who, who did uh, intrahippocampal injections and figured out things about how the hippocampus was working um, using different inbred strains and some selective lines. So there was some pharmacogenetics, but it was really minority. Most of it was just the behavior of the animal in the different models that we have available. Um, Studying biology in the, in the 70s in the Netherlands, uh, you had to do several lab rotations, two uh, of half a year and one of a year. So the one that I did for a year was with Hans van der Beelen. Uh, they had to be also very different. That was a requirement. You couldn't do uh, genetics, molecular genetics, and microbial genetics. Now it had to be very different. So I did behavior genetics and plant taxonomy. Um, so this was my second scientific publication, a revision of a plant genus used in aquariums. I told you that all the plants, aquarium plants was a passion of me. And I did this with Henk de Witt at the University of Wageningen, uh, close by Nijmegen, an agricultural university. And I think I learned more from him than he actually realized himself. Um, my, so my second publication had 49 pages. That, that sounds like a huge amount, but it, remember this is plant taxonomy. So a lot of the space was taken up by, by distribution maps and photos of inflorescences and um, professional drawings. I, I could not draw something like this myself. We had professional uh, uh, people doing, making such drawings of the different species that, um, that belong to this genius, which is from Western Central Africa. And it's still on my bucket list that one day I want to go to Africa and search for these plants in their real life habitat because that I didn't do at the time. Um, nevertheless, after these lab rotations and doing my masters, there was the PhD coming up. And I did this again with Hans van der Beelen. And the main part of my thesis was um, a dialogue cross. Now, a dialogue cross, I mentioned it earlier, but a dialogue cross consists of a number of inbred strains, here indicated by A, B, C, D, and they are then crossed in every possible combination, meaning that you also include reciprocals. So A mothers with B fathers, B mothers with A fathers. This will enable you to look at the genetic architecture of the behavior and at um, maternal, possible maternal, pre and postnatal maternal effects. Um, this is my thesis. There's a story about the mouse, but I can tell you that another time. Um, exploratory behavior, of course, it's, it's easy to say, but you have to define it. And so we spend a lot of time, Hans and I, on arriving at the definition of what is exploratory behavior, or what do we call exploratory behavior? And this is the, um, the definition that we came up with. The exploration is evoked by novel stimuli and consists of behavioral acts and postures. Uh, 
that permit the collection of information about new objects and unfamiliar parts of the environment. Um, what we noted uh, there is that there was a trade-off in open field behavior and exploratory behavior, a trade-off between curiosity on the one hand, curiosity to, for the new environment, open field, the animal has never been in there, you put the animal in the open field and, and study its behavior. Um, so curiosity on the one hand, fear on the other hand. Um, et etologists will call this curiosity and fear drives. Now note that therefore exploration is inferred. You don't measure exploration. You cannot measure exploratory behavior. What you measure is the behavioral acts and postures that you see in the open field. And from that, you, you infer that the animal is exploring. Another thing to note is that uh, we didn't talk about model. The word model doesn't occur in the whole thesis. And the word anxiety, uh, I think it's mentioned once and that's it. Um, fear, uh, anxiety is a human thing uh, more than, than that. We, we talked about fear. So a dialogue cross will allow you to uh, uncover the genetic architecture underlying a certain phenotype. And so we looked at the genetic architectures of the different behaviors that animals were displaying in an open field, like rearing, leaning, locomotor activity, sniffing at the object, leaning against the object, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what is genetic architecture? Well, you, you look at additive genetic effects and things like dominance, whether it's directional or ambidirectional. Ambidirectional dominance is a situation where you have multiple genes that influence uh, a phenotype. And for some genes, the direction of the dominance is towards high expression. For other genes, the direction of the dominance is towards low expression. In directional dominance, all genes have showed dominance in the same direction, either for high expression of the uh, characteristic or low expression of the characteristic. Um, now, now, why would you be interested in genetic architecture? Why were we at the time interested in genetic architecture? Well, imagine this, over the course of the of evolutionary history of, of a species, um, a behavior or any phenotype will have been exposed to natural selection. And it's quite logical that natural selection will have consequences for the genetic composition of, of the population for, in other words, for genetic architecture. So as kind of a genetic detective, you can turn that around and say, okay, let's look at the um, genetic architecture that we have. And what does that tell us about the evolutionary history of the phenotype that we are studying? And in, in for this evolutionary history, what we mainly would be interested in was whether the over time, the phenotype had been subjected to stabilizing selection or to directional selection. Stabilizing selection is a situation where uh, both extreme extremes are unfavorable. So high or low is both unfavorable. Uh, it's the intermediate expression of the phenotype that is most favorable for the survival of the animal. Uh, directional selection is a situation where either very high expression of the phenotype or very low expression of the phenotype is, um, is most favorable for the, for the animal. Now, stabilizing selection will result in a genetic architecture that is composed of significant additive genetic effects and ambidirectional dominance, whereas directional selection uh, will lead to low additive genetic variation uh, and but directional dominance in the direction of the selection. And so good science, as we all know, of course, starts first with a hypothesis, not with the results, first with the hypothesis. So the hypothesis that we, that we had was the following. Um, High levels of exploratory activity, we hypothesized, are advantageous uh, because it will allow an animal 
to find in a new environment that it doesn't know yet, to find food and water that it needs for survival, escape routes for uh, in case there, there is a predator around, uh, and eventually, of course, they will need mates to reproduce. So high levels of exploratory activity are advantageous for that. However, at the same time, um, exploratory activity, high levels of exploratory activity are disadvantageous because moving around in an environment you don't know yet very well um, will increase the risk of predation. You, you can't escape because you don't know the escape routes. Um, you make yourself visible by moving around. So our hypothesis therefore was that intermediate levels should be optimal. Neither very high nor very low exploratory activity should be optimal and would be the intermediate level. So what we expected was to find stabilizing selection. Now the results of that dialogue cross, which I'm not going to, to go into detail here, um, show significant additive genetic effects and m bidirectional dominance, which as we just saw before, indicated indeed an evolutionary history of stabilizing selection. This is not particular to mice, of course, it would, would apply to most other species, except perhaps top predators. I'm, I'm not sure that for lions, it will be very dangerous to uh, explore a new environment. Uh, but in any case, we, we expanded, uh, extended this, this result to paradise fish where Robert Gerlai uh, did a dialogue cross and he found the same genetic architecture in paradise fishes that we have found earlier in mice. So then that was my thesis. I finished my thesis and this was my list of publications at the time. The article I showed you earlier, Physiology Behavior 1978, uh, mind you, this is now 1983. I'm nearing the end of my PhD and I'm starting to look around for a postdoc. And more precisely, financing for postdoc. Two articles submitted and one article five years earlier. Um, I think it's safe to say that nowadays I would not get a postdoc. Fortunately, in those days, things were different. And somehow I impressed the committees that decided about things. And I actually got two financing, uh, two grants, uh, one from the NATO, NATO Science Fellowship. They don't exist anymore um, for one year to go to Heidelberg. And a second one, a German stipend, an Alexander von Humboldt stipend for two years to spend also in Germany. So off to Heidelberg for my postdoc. So Heidelberg, going to Heidelberg was very important and that, that's mainly because of these guys here below. Uh, this is Herbert Schwekler in Heidelberg. Um, we started a, a, a lifelong collaboration and a lifelong friendship. Um, Herbert worked to uh, collaborated on a lot of things with uh, Hans-Peter Lipp from Zurich and he too became uh, somebody that I collaborated a lot with and has become also a longtime friend. Um, why was this so significant for my development? Well, that was because now finally, um, where before I had been paying lip service to the hippocampus, it's mentioned in my thesis, but I only looked at behavior and did crosses. Now I actually started looking at things that were happening in the brain itself and how genetics was influencing that. So this is a, a schematic drawing of a, a mouse hippocampus, a rodent hippocampus. Um, it's, it's characterized by two layers of uh, neurons, the granular cells here in the dente gyrus and the pyramidal cells in CA3. And these granular cells project uh, into, have their axons descend into the hippocampus proper, C83 is this here, um, where they make synapses with the apical dendrites of the pyramidal cells. And those are the suprapyramidal mossy fibers, those that are above the pyramidal cells. And then there's this smaller projection, the infrapyramidal, intra and infrapyramidal mossy fibers, which 
like synapses on the basal dendrites of the pyramidal cells. Now, it's this projection that interested Schreckler and did most. And the reason for that was that if you, so here you have this in, in sections. If you look at different strains, you, you see big strain differences in neuroanatomy. So here you have the uh, granular cells. This is the pyramidal cell layer. And what is dark, this is the hilus. Here you have the suprapyramidal mossy fibers. And here you have the inter and intrapyramidal mossy fibers. And these are representative sections of different inbred strains. Some like this is DBA, uh, a very scant projections. Uh, Balp C, which has a projection that's always in the middle of the pyramidal cell layer, uh, black six, which has large projections, etc. Uh, with some uh, experience, you, you, you can actually recognize inbred strains by the hippocampus. So what Schwegler and Lip had done, and that was before I came to Heidelberg, um, they knew about this, this neuroanatomical variation in, in the hippocampus. And if you measure these, these projections, uh, the size differences can be like four to five times different. So that, that's really important, uh, an important difference. Uh, yeah, no emails back yet. <laughs> um, okay, so, so and here is a, is a missing slide. I've, <laughs> I forgot to, <laughs> anyway, I can tell you about it all. So what they had done was they had studied uh, these, these hippocampi and the hypothesis was that such strong variation in neuroanatomy uh, of, of a, an important brain structure, the hippocampus, should have consequences for behavior. And um, what they looked at was two-way active avoidance in a shuttle box. And what they found indeed was that there was a strong correlation between the size of the inter and infraparamidal mossy fiber projection and learning in a shuttle box. It was a negative correlation. The larger those projections were, uh, the worse animals would perform in a shuttle box and vice versa. Now, learning in a shuttle box is, is a bit of a strange test because it's one of very few tests that actually improve in brain damaged animals. If you lesion the hippocampus, shuttle box learning will become better. Um, on the other hand, if you take uh, a learning test like a radial maze, which I will describe more detail in a moment, um, if you look at, at radial maze learning, if you now lesion the hippocampus and test hippocampally lesioned animals in the radial maze, what you will find is that they are severely impaired. So it's the opposite. Lesions in the hippocampus improve shuttle box learning and make radial maze learning worse. So I hypothesized that um, then you would expect the opposite correlation to in radial maze. If shuttle box learning correlates negatively with mossy fiber projections, then radial maze should correlate uh, positively. The, the, the larger projections you would have, uh, the better they would learn. This is how we tested uh, animals in a radial maze. So first of all, um, as you will see here, it's put on the floor. I've, I've always found it a bit, a bit counterintuitive that people most commercially available radio mazes, for instance, that people will make elevated mazes and test learning in an elevated maze. Elevated plus mazes we use to test anxiety. Now imagine that you have two groups of animals that differ in levels of anxiety but have the same uh, learning capacities. You put them in an elevated radial maze and because of the difference in anxiety levels, you will find a difference in performance which you then subsequently are going to interpret as differences in learning, which isn't the case. So we put them on the floor uh, and the arms are enclosed. It's, it's plexiglass, so you can see it, but there's a, there's a cover on each one of these, these arms. Um, you don't want this to be a test of visual acuity. Um, so we put objects close to the arms so that it was visually as easy as possible. 
because of course some inbred strains have bad vision like like albino mice and some animals even have retinal degeneration and will eventually turn blind. Um, at the end of each each arm, which you can see here, there is fresh food pellets that are behind the partition so that the mouse cannot reach it. A little holes in those partitions. It means that an arm always smells like food, so they cannot smell or see whether there is a food reward. At the end of each arm, there is a little barrier um, that hides the food reward. And here's a happy mouse that found that. And the task, uh, the easiest task that you can do here, there, there are different tests that we did, but um, the one that I'm talking about, uh, all eight arms are getting a food reward and an error is counted if an animal enters an arm where it has already eaten the food reward. So it has to remember which arms have been visited, which arms not. Oh. Uh, something's going wrong. There we go. Um, Sorry about that. These are the results of a, a big study where we had uh, nine different inbred strains. And where we looked at the hippocampal mossy fiber distribution, as you see, it goes from below one to plus four. This is percentage of the CA3 and CA4 surface. Um, so it's a four or five difference, size difference in, in projection sizes. And here are the number of errors that these mice make on the last day of training. So we only test five days, one trial a day. This is something they learn very rapidly. They, they do as well as rats in this test. And what you see is that there's a hugely significant correlation. It's, it's negative, uh, meaning animals with larger projections make fewer errors, so they learn better. These are the better animals, and these, these animals are those that don't get it. So now we get to the 1990s and things starting to change. Um, around 1990, uh, techniques became available to uh, genetically uh, manipulate our animals. Uh, by either inducing transgenes or even more interesting targeted mutations where we could target a specific gene. It was a huge taking, it took years to do this, uh, but it revolutionized the field. Um, the result of it was because the, the, the embryonic stem cells, the stem cells that you needed to make targeted uh, mutants uh, were mouse stem cells. Uh, basically, behavioral neuroscience and behavioral genetics became almost exclusively mouse work. Uh, the rat almost disappeared from the field. Uh, fruit flies knew to maintain themselves, and a new appearance on the field was uh, C. elegans worms, um, where a lot of exciting science was being done. Another difference was that now neuroscience and pharmacology became a very important part. And another side effect is that um, we won the battle. Genes influence behavior, but we lost the war in a sense because uh, we don't call ourselves behavior geneticists or even behavior neurogeneticists anymore, but we're now all neuroscientists. Nevertheless, I maintain that what we do is behavior genetics. Now, the biggest change of all is something else, and something that people not rarely uh, comment about. And I think that here the word paradigm shift, the expression paradigm shift, is, is actually at its place. The behavior genetics, as I did for my thesis and my master's thesis, um, was animal centered, as I, I think I mentioned that before. We were trying to understand the how and why. Why do some animals behave differently from other animals? That was very fundamental research. We were interested in the mouse as a mouse, nothing else. It didn't mean anything else. We were just interested in how does that work? How does a mouse hippocampus work? Uh, what's this about? But since the 1990s, things changed. Funding changed, and now to get funding, um, Similarly, your animal had to be a model of a human pathology. And 
the emphasis now became was not so much anymore trying to understand the how and why just to understand the elements uh, but it was more an emphasis on how can we apply what we are doing um, how can we go from bench to bedside and no matter how twisted because of course a lot of times you you're looking at a mouse or a mouse mutant and it really is not a model for anything but for instance if, if a mouse mutants show deficits in pre-pulse inhibition, then whether we knew whether that gene was involved in schizophrenia, yes or no, this suddenly was a mouse model of, of schizophrenia. Uh, you can't really blame researchers for doing that because if, if you didn't say things like that, you wouldn't get any money if you would say, I'm just interested in how exploratory behavior works. Uh, in, in a mouse that I put in an open field and I want to in investigate that, then that would not be interesting. So nowadays, if we do uh, an open field test, it's not exploratory behavior that we're looking at anymore, but it's anxiety. It's now certainly an anxiety test. We look at tickmotaxis and stuff like that. Uh, I was not immune to, to that either, so I switched over to doing animal models of disorders. And one model that we looked at was unpredictable chronic mild stress, um, which is a model for a major depressive disorder in, in humans. What, what you do is um, randomly, semi-randomly, twice a day, some days at 9 a.m., some days at 11 a.m., 3 p.m., 4 p.m., at random times, at least for the animal. Uh, of course, we follow the very... A precise schedule and it, 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 I can tell you it, it drives you nuts. It's chronic mild stress for the human uh, person too. And it's it's mild stresses. You, you take the home cage of the animals and put it at an angle and leave it for a couple of hours that way. Or you put them in an empty cage uh, with nothing in there. Or this is actually a pretty severe stressor uh, cage switching. So you take animals, the cage is, is soiled, you take the animals from this cage, put them in this cage, and the animal from this cage and this cage, and suddenly now for four hours they're in an environment that smells and feels like somebody else. I'm in somebody else's home, where am I? I want to go home to my own home. Um, predator sounds, reverse light dark so, so basically every day something unpleasant happens and this for several weeks in a row. And you can imagine that if they would do that with a human being, um, if you have chronic mild stress, so each, each time something unpleasant happens, you never know when it's gonna happen. You only know it will happen. Uh, after a while, you get pretty much depressed. We, uh, we subjected three different inbred strains, Black 6, Palp C, and DBA2 to this, uh, to this procedure. And and looked at neurogenesis in the hippocampus in the subcranial zone and in the subventricular zone. And what you see is that new cell formation uh, was in, in, incredibly reduced in, in both of these, these regions. Uh, the only group where it was not significant was in B6 females. So the number of new cells being formed was still almost the same in in, in B6 females. But then if you looked at what proportion of the newborn cells um, were uh, differentiating into neurons, then it became even worse. And now this is significant also for the B6s. So there was a devastating effect on neurogenesis um, of this procedure, regardless of which strain or sex that you were looking at. It was significant in all of them. We also looked at behavior, of course, in, in these animals and how the behavior changed due to the, um, the chronic stress procedure. And to our surprise, there was not really a systematic correlation with impairments in like radio maze learning or contextual acute fear conditioning. Um, and the, the uh, amount of the, the change in neurogenesis. Um, Similarly, we found large effects on anxiety, which we tested in both plus maze and light dark box, and in depressive like behavior, which we tested in four swim and uh, in the tail suspension test. Um, 
So there were large effects, which is what you would expect. The, the animals are su supposed to become depressed, so they should have depressive-like behavior in the four-swim tail suspension test and should become anxious in the plus maze low dive box. However, what we found was that the tests were severely specific to, that the results were severely specific to which test that um, we were using. Uh, so animals that, that were very anxious in one test might not be very anxious in another or not at all. And animals that, that scored as depressive like in the four swim test were perhaps normal in the tail suspension test. And there was even one case where it was opposite in where a group was significantly uh, depressed in one test and significantly not depressed in the other test. I come back to that. Um, Eventually, we, we started looking at um, knockout mice to no mutant mice. And the first uh, one that we looked at uh, was the FMR1 no mutant mouse. Uh, it's a model for fragile X syndrome. And um, fragile X syndrome, curiously enough, not that many people are familiar with it, but it's, it's the most frequent heritable cause of mental retardation in humans. It's mainly boys because it's on the X chromosome. And um, it's due to mutation in the FMR1 gene. Um, and that mutation has been replicated in non-mutant mice, so they don't produce the FMRP protein anymore. Uh, we looked at the hippocampus of these animals. This is a, a wild type black six animal with large mossy fiber, inter and infrapraminal mossy fiber projections. And you can see that in the knockout mice, this is much smaller. And as expected, given the correlation that we found between radio maze learning and, um, and hippocampal mossy fibers, uh, we tested these animals in the radio maze and we found the expected learning deficit between uh, the mutants and the wild type animals with the mutants performing significantly as well. They didn't learn, but they didn't learn as well as the, as the uh, wild times. Around that time, I was approached by a, a pharmaceutical company and they were asking me, uh, they had a molecule that uh, they hoped would be effective in autism. It, it fizzled later and so never much came out of it. But they asked me whether I could test that, that molecule in mice. And my first reaction to them was, well, well autism, you, you can't test that in human beings, in, in, in mice. It's, it's, it's a very human disorder. Uh, there's no way I can test that in mice. I can look at anxiety if you want to do a plus mice test. Uh, but they put a bug in my ear and I started thinking about, is it really true? Is there nothing that we can do? And around that time, this must have been something like 2001 or 2002, uh, other people, uh, foremost among them Jacqueline uh, Crowley. Other people also started thinking about how can we model autism in mice? And there's actually a lot you can do. Um, mice have a lot of behaviors that, that uh, are influenced if you would have, say, an autistic mouse. Uh, mice have a rich social behavior. So social behavior deficits is one of the main characteristics of autism. So you can look at changes in social behavior in, um, in, in mice. Stereotypical behavior, cognitive rigidity. Um, in short, th there's quite a lot that, that you can look at. So I, we, we have been using since then fragile X mice and looking at autistic features in these fragile X mice. Whether fragile X mice are a good model for autism themselves, I don't know, uh, but 40 to 50% of fragile X patients have autistic symptoms and a large proportion of these patients are even um, diagnosed as suffering from autism. Um, so at least we can look at autistic features in, in, in fragile X mice as a model for autistic features in fragile X patients. And we did a very short, small experiment 
here we looked at uh, social behavior, social interaction. This was direct social interaction. So the animal is in its home cage and you introduce uh, another animal to it, a stimulus animal. And then you just count the number of interactions between those animals in, a, I think this was a two minute period. You, you interrupt that for 10 minutes and then do it again, do it again, do it again. And what you see, these are three different inbred strains, Black 6, DBA2, and Balp C. And what you see is, is a decrease over time habituation to the stimulus mouse. Then in the fifth session, what you do is you give another stimulus mouse. So here you, each time you get the same stimulus mouse, here you get a different stimulus mouse. And what you then see is that, although there has been habituation to the other stimulus mouse, to the earlier one, the new stimulus mouse makes that there is a re resurgence of uh, interaction and that it goes back to the initial level. Now, if you do that with fragile X mice, so here you have the black sixes, and here you have the fragile X animals. Uh, the black sixes, there is a significant decrease over time, uh, over the four first four sessions, and then an increase if you present a new stimulus mouse that they haven't seen yet. Um, whereas if you do this with the fragile X mice, uh, this is actually not a significant difference. There is no significant uh, change over time. Basically, this is statistically speaking a flat line. These animals are much less interested in a stimulus mouse. And of course, if you present a new stimulus mouse, uh, they don't go up either because they just stay at the same level that they had. So there is a social behavior deficit in, in fragile X mice, which since then, we have replicated many times, uh, also using the uh, three compartment test that Jackie Crawley uh, devised. By now, we, we come to the, the, the present, recent development, CRISPR. CRISPR is very important because CRISPR enables not only uh, makes it very easy to make or, or relatively easy to make knockout animals much more than it used to be, but it can be used with different species too. And what we see is that in, in recent years, the rat is making a comeback. Um, I, I just talked about fragile X knockout mice. We now also have fragile X uh, knockout rats. Um, because CRISPR it is not necessarily species specific. It can be used in different species. So more species are being uh, used to induce mutations and then study the effects of those mutations. And a second uh, important uh, part of, of what's going on is that zebra fish is becoming more and more the animal of choice uh, because it has all kinds of, of advantages for studying the effects of genes on behavior. Um, so, so where are we? What's, what's the current issues and problems? What, what are the main problems that face us and the more conceptual ones? Well, recently there's been a lot of talk about the replication crisis. Um, we had a meeting a couple of years ago in, in Tel Aviv and uh, there was a review article that uh, came out of that um, where with a group of people we talked about what causes the replication crisis and how should we address that and we can see that article is very interesting but there was no really uh, much agreement about how to handle this how to deal with this it's it's a complicated question personally i think that part of the problem is that we don't know what we are measuring uh, as I mentioned earlier in the experiments with the chronic mild stress, um, results obtained in tests that are supposed to measure the same thing, anxiety, behavioral despair, do not necessarily correlate with each other. The fact that we decide that uh, both the forced swim test and the tail suspension test measure behavioral despair and are therefore a measure of, of depressive behavior, uh, 
that doesn't mean that the mice experience that in the same way. So we use a lot of tests. Uh, we all think we know what they mean, but actually we never really tested that. What is necessary is, is um, validation of the different tests and cross-validation of the different tests. We have to figure out what exactly it is that we are measuring, how phenotypes should be defined and figure out what those phenotypes actually mean. And this, even though this talk has been mainly about uh, about animals, uh, this is something that actually also plays a role in in um, in psychiatry, uh, psychiatric genetics, um, because a lot of the phenotypes there, schizophrenia, autism, uh, bipolar disorder, uh, they are based only on behavioral phenotypes. Um, and whether they are actually entities uh, or whether there is perhaps a group of disorders that, that all look like schizophrenia but are that different, we just don't know at this point. Okay, then finally, a thank you. A thank you to all, well, first of all, to all of you for your patience in listening at my personal reminiscences. Um, thank you to the organizers. But above all, a thank you to the people listed on this page here, uh, who have all been, in one way or another, very important for my career, uh, for collaborations that we had, or uh, most people I've published with, but not all of them. Um, some of them were just very important with the discussions that we had, and I learned a lot from all of these people. And I've certainly forgotten some people, so my apologies for that. And finally, uh, Hans van der Beelen, who passed away uh, way too early at 62, uh, who was at the origin of this. And I, he was my, uh, my teacher, my mentor, and he became a very close personal friend, as are all the people on this, on this list here. It was a life of a career of behavior genetics, but the people I encountered along the way made it much more interesting and much more agreeable than it would have been without them. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I'm ready to answer. Thank you, uh, Dr. Crucio. I'll, I'll clap on everyone's behalf. <laughs> um, if there are, are questions, uh, you can post them in the chat. Um, I uh, I have one already uh, from Carl uh, from Carl Clark. He says, "Wim, if you were starting your career now, what excites you the most?" <laughs> Oof, that's a tough question. If I would start it now. Well, it, it, it's actually the fact that we can get to the genes. I mean, one of one thing I, I haven't mentioned here is is gene localization studies, uh, where where we, we we've done quite a few of those in recent years. Where we looked at BXD recombinant inbreds. Um, the thing is, if you compare this to when I started doing baby genetics, in that in those days, genes were kind of like virtual. They they were a concept, uh, but you never could get them in hand. Uh, most behaviors are, of course, not monogenetically regulated. Uh, but even if you had a mutation, um, at best what you could do is crossbreed them with uh, a known mutation, a code column mutant or something, and count recombinations. And so you would have like a rough mapping of the gene. Uh, but that was basically what you could do. And nowadays we, we can look at gene expression levels, we can uh, we, we get to the gene. That, that's very exciting, I think. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, questions coming in. Um, so one from uh, uh, Jesse Cushman. Uh, she says, great talk. How do you see the SGZ postnatal neurogenesis changes relate to the infrapyramidal mossy fiber differences? Uh, 
Yeah, I wish we had done that, but we didn't. There was only so much you could do. So we, you, you can't do uh, the mossy fiber staining in the same sections that you do uh, the neurogenesis. So we had to choose either neurogenesis or uh, mossy fibers. So we chose for the neurogenesis. Now, my guess is that it wouldn't have that much effect on, on, uh, on mossy fibers because um, you do this with adult animals, three month old animals. And so they already have a lot of granular cells. Um, you, you do the chronic mild stress, you get fewer neurogenesis, but um, I, I think that at least initially, this would not have much effect on the size of the projections. Of course, this is just speculation. We didn't look at it. Uh, a question from Catherine Rankin. Uh, nice talk, Wim. What do you think about the emphasis on modeling disease rather than basic discovery? Does it lead us to a more dishonest interpretation of our data? How do we navigate that? <laughs> yeah, you sometimes wonder if you see reasonings and interpretations of data uh, and how far those people believe themselves. Um, I think I said it before, we're forced to do this because if you don't do it, you don't get money. And without money, you can't do research. That's another thing that has changed a lot. Um, in the 80s and, and even part of the 90s, the experiments that I would run, um, of course, they were relatively cheap experiments. All you needed was, was students or postdocs or yourself to observe the animals and test them. Um, and I, I had the luck of being in institutions where I didn't pay per diems. So my mice didn't cost me anything. So basically we ran the whole lab we, on, on the, the, the uh, support that we would get from university or later in, in France from the uh, CNRS, the National Research Council. Uh, it would give you support to do research. They still do that, but by now it's, it's so little money that there's not much you can do with that anymore and you have to apply for money. So in the 80s and 90s, it didn't matter whether, whether what I was doing was a model for autism or a model for depression or whatever. Um, but now, if you are asking for money, uh, you're not going to get money to figure out what a mouse is doing in an op open field and why some mice explore a lot and other mice don't explore a lot because that's not bench to bed side. You have to come up with, uh, we're looking at a model of blah, blah, blah. And I think it's, it's an impoverishment of, of the work that we do it because I think that actually, if you do a lot of this fundamental work, in the end, it will, make you understand better what's going on and that will have its beneficial effects on the bench to bedside movement. Speaking of models of blah blah blah, I'm sort of interested in uh, like for example in your chronic uh, unpredictable stress, uh, the data that you showed, you showed a lot of neurobiological effects and not so much behavioral effects and I'm wondering how much of that might be latent or you know maybe if you look at you know age dependent effects you might see things and then a related question from Dr. Havada just in general what kind of behavioral tests do you see used in the future should we test mice in more naturalistic settings to sort of extract some of these phenotypes well Naturalistic settings, I mean, it, it, that's a thing that Hans-Peter Lipp has been doing a lot. And, and I, he, he actually uh, created a laboratory in, in a very remote area in Russia where he made huge enclosures. I, I think they were 40 by 40 meters and tested mice in a semi-natural environment. There was even predation. I mean, sometimes the mouse would disappear because an owl had eaten it. And um, going to more uh, naturalistic uh, situations is certainly something that I think is, is, uh, is useful. 
um, because it, it will allow the animal to display a much, a much more rich repertoire of behaviors. Um, as for the uh, chronic mild stress, we, we did do a lot of behavior. I just didn't present the data this time. Uh, but look up the articles. There's, there's at least three articles about that experiment. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goldowitz, I'm going to save your question for last. Uh, and uh, Dr. Lee says, uh, thank you, Wim. If you were working with, with fruit fly and were asked, why do you think fruit fly behavior is relevant for human mental health? <laughs> How would you answer that? <laughs> well, um, th there are fragile X fruit fly mutants. Uh, the fruit fly, it, it turns out that flies have an fmr one gene too. And, and so, they have created knockouts. Um, of course, it's it's much more difficult to take a fruit fly behavior and uh, extrapolate that to humans. But uh, I, I think that um, if if you look at fruit flies and certain genes, um, you do it the other way around. You take genes that you already know are important in in human disorders, and then you can use a fruit fly model. Uh, which is much easier to use than mice. They, they take fewer space, they're much cheaper. You don't have a hassle with an eye of um, it, 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 uh, There are all kinds of advantages. And you can study the effect of the gene in that animal. And that might give you ideas on what exactly to look for in more closer to humans related animals like mice. Thank you. Uh, we we just have one more question. I thought this would be a good one to end on uh, from Doc, uh, from Daniel Goldowitz. Uh, he says, "Wim, wonderful to hear about your trek through time and space. In those wanderings, can you reflect on the genesis and the actualization of genes to behavior?" GTB. Ah. Um. I have. I have to think about that. That's a long time ago by now. It's 20 years ago. And, and of course, this started earlier. Uh, first, we had the society, iBanks. And, um, and then actually publishers talked to me and said, aren't you interested in starting a journal for your society? And um, I talked with different publishers. Uh, the title actually uh, was, uh, came from discussions with Elsevier. We, we uh, at first uh, black hole at the time they were not really interested, um, but they were providing me with advice. The person Eileen Boyd Squires, the publisher at, at Black Hole, that handled this area, um, she she uh, was the head of the Paris office actually. Um, we talked about starting a new journal, how to go about it, and so she gave me some advice, but told me that they weren't interested. Um, so I talked with, with Elsevier. Elsevier wanted me to do uh, an online only journal um, on, on a website that, of them that they have been creating. And I forget the name, it, it, it folded a few years later. So I think it was a good decision not to go with that. Um, but uh, Nello Spiteri, some of you may know him, um, Nello came up with, I, I have a title for your journal, it should be Genes and Behavior. And it won't surprise you after the talk that you have seen uh, that I immediately said, no, I don't like that title. The, the brain has to be in there. So genes, brain, and behavior. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so in the end, we didn't go with Elsevier. And uh, it turned out that Blackwell, after all, was interested. And um, Eileen Boyd Squires uh, was not too enthusiastic about the title and originally Jean's Brain and Baby, but she said, it's too long. I said, yeah, but then we just abbreviated G2B. And she said, I like that. So that's how it came about. And in the end, we, we, we signed the contract with, uh, with Blackwell, which now is Wiley Blackwell. Thank you. Yeah, yes, I mean, I meant to say Jean's Brain and Behavior when I asked the question. Uh, thank you very much for a great talk. Uh, I want to uh, 
echo Jackie Crawley, who also said in the chat, uh, congratulations, Wim, great talk, best wishes as uh, you transition to retirement. Thank you. Uh, she also says, let's keep in touch. And I think that goes for all of us. We want to continue. Oh, absolutely. To I, I won't disappear in next July. <laughs> Uh, great, thank you. thank you again. Uh, I'll pop on everyone's behalf again. Um, thank you, my pleasure. But before uh, we say goodbye today, I do want to mention to the group that uh, uh, Dr. Crucio's talk was uh, the first in uh, a seminar series that will be going uh, will be happening on a monthly basis uh, until next April. Um, next month, we have Ian Mays, who uh, looks at chromatin regulation. Um, Jackie Crawley herself is coming on uh, in December on the 16th. This is all posted on our website. We have Laverne Malone uh, in January, Rohan Palmer in, in uh, February, and then Francesca Talisi uh, in March. Uh, we have one in April too that uh, I haven't filled yet, um, but that'll be coming. I'm, I'll post the site for this in the chat now, um, so you can bookmark it and keep an eye on it, uh, but you'll also see emails come from iBanks as the seminars are uh, announced. Again, uh, thanks, Wim. I really ap appreciate uh, uh, this is such a great way to start off the seminar series with Thank you. a 45 year, uh, 45 year overview of behavior genetics. Um, and again, I, I thank you very much. Thank you, my pleasure. Bye everybody. Goodbye everybody. Thanks for coming everyone. Bye. -bye. See Bye. Ya. Bye.